Well, good morning and welcome. So glad to see all of you today. I just feel like y'all are ready to have church today. I just feel like, I feel like y'all are ready. I'm ready. Let's just have church today. I mean, we've been having church. Our worship team, you guys, like let's never get used to the level of like the quality of a worship team that we have and uh, so glad that you guys are excited for Pastor Lena to come back. He is so excited. And I just wanted to take a moment and thank you guys as a church, as a family. I wanted to thank you as our dream team and especially our lead team as well for all that you guys have helped um, just carry in the ways that you have stepped in maybe to do different things in this season of his sabbatical. If you are here for the first time, welcome. We're so glad you are here. Um, you're listening into a little bit of a family moment because Pastor Lenin has been on sabbatical for the last five weeks. This is his sixth week and he'll be back next Sunday. You guys have been so gracious to, to me, <laughs> preaching a little more than usual. Um, Crystal got to share a word. We've had a couple of guests. But you guys have been so gracious, so receiving. I am so grateful. And really, we just honor you guys as our dream team. Y'all have been amazing. And, and really, we couldn't have gone through this last season without you as our dream team. This has been an incredible season, especially for Pastor Landon, as he, for the first time in 17 years of full-time ministry, has taken an extended amount of time off. He has been pedal to the metal for 17 years. I have seen it firsthand. And so I am so honored by you guys that y'all have stepped in and been so supportive, so faithful, and just so generous with your time and everything else to allow him this season for God to speak to him in extraordinary, significant ways that is really going to help advance our whole church, and not just as a church, but guys, it's the kingdom of God to our community. It's the kingdom to our city. We can give the Lord a hand for that. And while you've got your hands together, can we just thank our dream team? Thank you, dream team. I say it all the time, but I mean it. You guys are the dreamiest of all teams, and we couldn't do what we do without you guys. If you're here for the first time, you can tell this is not our church building. We are a portable church, and what you see, our dream team does every single Sunday, and we really couldn't bring the gospel to our community in this context the way we do without our dream team. So we honor you guys so much. We're so grateful to you, and I promise you guys, Pastor Layden is so excited to be back with you next Sunday, and so uh, we'll be looking forward to that. And so also, if you're here for the first time, our church exists to take every believer through a spiritual journey. That is to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And so not last week, because we had Pastor Jackie here, which, by the way, this is not a rabbit trail. This is intended. Thank you for receiving him so well. He is one of our overseers, and our church would not be here without the love and support and faithfulness of Pastor Jackie's relationship to us. He speaks in a very prophetic kind of way, and so if there's anyone who could speak on integrity like he did last week, it's Pastor Jackie. They say, the proof is in the pudding, and that is absolutely true for Pastor Jackie, who has faithfully served the church um, for over 35 years, and his grown children, his children's spouses, his grandchildren, they all love the Lord and love the church after decades of ministry, and I think that speaks volumes. And so thank you for receiving him last week. The week before was part one of wh where I am today. And so part one, if you want to go back a couple of weeks to so part one of Walk This Way, uh, I laid out the biblical foundation for our church's mission of know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Laid out the, the biblical foundation of God's promises to his people throughout scripture as to how we got to those four points. I won't rehash it all today, but I just want to let you know that foundation is laid in part one of this series if you want to go back and listen to it. So this series, Walk This Way, what we also defined last week was the swish. Can you do it with me? Go swish. Everybody loves that swish. If you've ever played basketball, you love that swish. The ball in the net means that you have made it, that, that you have scored that point, and everybody needs that swish. And if, as a church, our mission is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, what is that swish? How do I know if I'm on it? If you're here for the first time or you've been walking with us for a while, how do you know if you are actually on the journey? How do you know if you've made that swish? Well, last two weeks ago, we defined the swish for know God as I can be confident that I know God when I, reg when I live a lifestyle where I hear his voice and do what he says. And I hope that that helped clarify for you and even challenge you in your relationship with God to really tune in to his voice and to practice hearing him and then to be confident and step out in faith to do what you believe he's calling you to do. And the more you do that, the more you practice it, 
the more you recognize his voice in your life. So you can be confident that you know God when you hear his voice and do what he says. Because I have two weeks and we have four steps. You know, there, there are two that I had to choose. So I went with my favorite one, which is discover purpose. But really, you can't discover purpose without finding freedom. So we're going to talk a little bit about finding freedom. The first part was how I know that I know God. We're going to mesh in finding freedom. And then today we're talking about discovering purpose. How do I, what is that swish for knowing that I have discovered my purpose? And our key verse for this series is in 1 John 2, 5, and 6. And it says, by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And I'd imagine that on any given Sunday, we have two groups of people in here, that there are two different sets of observations happening. There may be one group here today who is kind of kicking the tires of Christianity. You're kind of feeling it out. You're not so sure on what you believe yet. That's fine. I'm so glad you are here today. And I want you to know that you can absolutely belong before you believe, that you're in a safe place to work out what you believe. There may be certain aspects that you're like, I understand these things. I'm not so sure about these things. You're welcome here. We're glad you are here. You absolutely can belong before you believe all of the things. The other group that may be making an observation this morning are those who have declared Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They identify themselves as a Christian, as a Christ follower. And so this series, Walk This Way, is what does that mean? If I'm a Christ follower and we are called to walk this way, and according to the scripture in 1 John, it says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. That's what we're looking at today. And so I would... I. Even in the first series or the first message, I offered this question for some thoughtful reflection. And it is, how deeply is your belief in Jesus influencing the way you live? That's our question. And so today, as we're talking about discovering our purpose, discovering our purpose, our God-given purpose, is a clarity spiral. And I talked about this in the first message when it comes to knowing God. Although our steps of know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, it's laid out very linear, linearly. It's not really just a straight line journey. It's a clarity spiral where you're gaining clarity more and more as you go. You don't, in a moment, know God or in a season, or in a year, or whatnot of your life, know God, and then you move on to the next thing. You know God, and then you continue to know him more as you're finding freedom, as you're discovering your purpose, as you're making a difference, as you're doing those things, you're, you're gaining more and more clarity on who God is. You're gaining more and more clarity on what finding freedom is, and the same is true with discovering purpose. It is a clarity spiral that as you gain more clarity into your purpose, it just progresses over time, so it's not a linear step. And for most people, discovering your purpose is our lifelong journey. Most of us will be um, much more seasoned and mature in life when we really discover why God has put me on this planet. And I think the church has made major strides in helping people discover their God-given purpose. In fact, it's 20 years old at this point, but I think that it's still one of the ever top-selling books in all of time was The Purpose-Driven Life. And it came out 20 years ago. And it was such a hit because people, were, people are asking and have been asking and are still asking this very important question. What is my purpose? Why am I here? And so we are a church that believes in the unique calling and purpose of every single believer. Psalm 139 talks about all the days ordained for me. That every single day of your life, God has ordained for you. God has a, has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. And so that's what we're going to unpack a little bit today. And while there are specific purposes that each of us have, those specific days that God has ordained for us, there is also a purpose that God has for us as the church. There is a purpose that God has for us as Christians. And I think that it is difficult to get to the specific when we don't know the basic. I think it's hard to know exactly what is, what is Kelly Kiker's calling. For me specifically, as a, as a unique individual, if I don't understand my identity and my calling as a Christian. 
So that's actually where we're going to be today. If you're interested in knowing more of the specific, we are a church that believes in that, and we want to help equip you and empower you and give you the tools that you need to walk that out, to discover that. And so we would love to invite you to Growth Track if you haven't done that. Gr growth Track is a time where we do some personality assessments, we take some spiritual gifts tests, and we want to help you discover the specific and unique and special way in which God has wired and designed you. Today we're going to be talking about our, our calling and our purpose as Christians. So here's our swish for today. Here's our swish for knowing I have discovered my purpose. I know I have discovered my purpose. Here's your swish. Which, by the way, I tried to show up to our basketball small group last Sunday just for a photo for today because they laughed at me when I told them I wanted to come play basketball with them. That's just a joke. That's just a joke. It makes probably Matt feel bad because he's such a nice guy. Um, but I was camping with my family and couldn't go. Lucky for them. Lucky for them, I couldn't go. Oh, yeah. I have growth track. And y'all do too, so we can't go. All right, here's your swish. I know I have discovered my purpose when I am walking securely and confidently in my identity and calling. That's your swish. That's your swish for today. And, and I believe that words matter. And I think that we are, especially in a, in a time in history, in our culture, where the definition of a word really matters. When we say um, equality, what does that mean? When we say diversity, what does that mean? When we say unity, what does that mean? Definitions to a word, the meaning of a word matters. So we're actually going to unpack this statement today. We're going to talk about what is, what is your identity and what is your calling? And we're going to help define some of these terms. And so if the series is walk this way, and we're to walk the way that Jesus walked, how did Jesus walk in his calling? How did Jesus walk securely and confidently in his identity and his calling? Honestly, there's a whole lot of ways we could go with that. But I had to narrow it down because this is not a dissertation. So Matthew 5, 48, it says, You, therefore, must be perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. And all the air in the room just got sucked out. Because who can do this? And in fact, I, I personally struggled with this verse today, sharing with you. Because I thought, no, it's just it's a little off-putting. Maybe it's a little too strong. There are a number of other verses I could choose. And even as I was just studying out this message, it's worked out in me as well. And I had to wrestle with this myself. So as I have wrestled with it, I, I bring it to you to wrestle with as well. And we're going to define the term perfect also. So here's this call. And th these are the words of Jesus says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If this is God's will for us, this just doesn't seem likely. I might as well go on American Idol and try to win. Or become a professional basketball player. Or go to the moon. I should... Any of those things actually seem way more likely than this being true for me for a hot minute. It just doesn't seem, it seems like a fairy tale. There's no way that this is achievable for me. And I know what you would say. You would say, Kelly, you could do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And I would say, thank you for misusing that scripture in context to me. I actually don't have the mental acumen to be an astronaut. I don't. It would not go well for any of us. I don't have the talent to be a singer. I don't. I have limitations and I'm okay with those. And I'm not going to let scripture be misused in context to make me unaware of my limitations. We have limitations. It's okay. So be perfect. This is the call to us. This is God's word to us. And so this word we're, we're going to talk about because I think perfection is daunting. This call to, to be perfect as he is perfect is daunting because, no, I'm much more comfortable with the fact that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm much more, more comfortable with the fact that it's not by what I have done to receive God's grace and mercy. It's what he's done on the cross. I'm much more comfortable with knowing that, that it is by the blood of Jesus. I'm much more comfortable with that than the thought that I could be perfect as he is perfect. So there's this, this daunting struggle. And it's like, well, you know, Jesus doesn't want me to be perfect. He loves me just as I am. I don't have to be perfect because my relationship with Jesus is not religion. And striving to be perfect is religion. And religion is dead. And God just wants a relationship with me. So we, we use these kinds of words as like a, a, to justify our lifestyle. When the truth is, this is God's will for our lives. So this truth 
In Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This truth is as true for my life as any other truth in the word. This truth is as true for my life as the things that are easy for me to accept, that he wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever ask or imagine. Yes and amen to that. I'll get the praise team back up here right now. We can do a praise dance. I can praise to that. I can believe that, that he has plans and, pur- and purpose for me, plans to, to give me hope and a future. I can praise to that. I can believe that God's going to work all things together for my good, that he's going to take all of the pain and all of my failures and all of my sin and all of my mistakes, and he's going to work that together for his glory and maybe your freedom at the same time. I can believe God for that. But guys, how hard is it to believe also every part of Scripture, even the one that says to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But this word perfect isn't maybe the perfect that you think it is. So let's define the term. This word perfect is a Greek word, teleos. And this definition, I think, is so significant that I wanted to share it with you. And this is what, what my Bible says. This is the definition in the, in the study concordance in the back of my Bible. It says that this term, perfect, means complete. It's through application of labor, growth, mental and moral character. It's mature. It it means that it has reached its goal, its purpose, that it is full, that it's complete, that it's lacking nothing, that it's full grown in mind and understanding, in knowledge and in truth, in Christian faith and virtue. This word is not to be confused with without sin or sinless. So So maybe you can take a breath. Can we bring the air back in the room? You can take a deep breath. This word perfect does not mean without sin or sinless. Jesus has done that. We are not called to be the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb to be crucified on the cross. That's not us. That is Jesus. This word denotes progress. It denotes a process. It's a a forward-moving word that that describes movement. It's an action word, advancement, that we're becoming mature, that we're being developed. So you can relax. You don't have to be perfect. Not sinless, not blameless. But in a process of becoming mature is what it means. Because the truth is that God's purpose for each of us is holiness. And I think that holiness is difficult to preach on because it's difficult to live out. And I had to kind of even seek that out in my own preparing of this. Holiness is hard to preach on because it's hard to live out. It's hard to embrace that it is God's will for us. It is God's calling for us that we are to be holy that we're to be set apart. God's will for us is that we are to be developed. I have a baby son, and when I say baby son, I mean that he's six. It's just that he's the baby, that he's the youngest. He's our baby son. And when our baby son, who is not actually a baby, is six, when he baby talks, it is not cute. It's not endearing. It's not even irritating. Like, it's just just irritating. When my six-year-old baby talks, it's irritating. But when he was a baby and he, he would talk, like when a baby talks, it's really cute. It's very cute. And they say their little words. They have their little ways of saying it. It's very cute. But years down the road, when that same child can say the same thing in the same way, we can say it together. It ain't cute. It ain't, it ain't cute when a six-year-old talks like a one-year-old because he's now six. This is kind of the idea that I'm talking about, that we're on a process and that we're on a journey. The kids have this book, and it's called If I Could Keep You Little. And I think we feel that as parents, like, ah, time just goes so fast. If I could just slow it down, and if I could just keep you little. But the truth is none of us really want to keep them little forever. That would be failure as a parent to baby them forever. We eventually, although we love them when they're little, when they do the next things and the next stage that they grow and develop, it's exciting. And this book, If I Could Keep You Little, says that's like, if I could swing you all the time, I would, but then I'd miss you discovering that you could actually soar as high as the trees. And it's this really sweet story that goes through all of these different things. If I could keep you little, but then I'd, I'd miss this next step in your development. I'd miss this next step in your process. I'd miss this next step of your growth because none of us want to plant a seed in a garden and not grow. This is God's will for us that we grow. It is God's will for us that we are developed. And I think a lot of times we love the idea of Christianity. 
without always loving its implications. Holiness is an implication of Christianity. We love the idea of fitness. We don't always love its implications. Because we love tacos, and we love donuts, and we love Netflix, and I mean, that list could go on. So it's human nature. I'm not coming down on any of us. I'm, I'm here with you. We, we often love the idea of something, but not always its implications. We love the idea of Christianity, but we struggle with its implications, which in this context this morning is holiness. So here's a statement for you. I have not been called to live like hell and rest in heaven. We've been called to live lives that have been arrested by heaven. So God's desire for us on this side of heaven is holiness. And there are a lot of scriptures that talk about God's desire for us to be developed, God's desire for us to be mature. Here's a list of them for you. A lot of them we'll go over today. We won't have time for all of them, but I wanted to share them with you. If you have that list of scriptures, there's a few of them. And so we know that we have discovered our purpose when we are walking securely and confidently in our identity and calling. Our identity and calling. Our, and these are going to be the words we unpack today. Our identity as a Christian and our calling to holiness our identity as a Christian, and our calling to holiness. So I, I know I've discovered my purpose when I'm walking securely and confident in knowing I'm a Christian called to holiness. So point number one for us today, we're going to have three points that help define identity and calling. Point number one is that God wants me to be developed. How? By applying biblical truth to my life. And, and the what, what is being developed, is my faith and character. God desires to develop my faith and my character by applying biblical truth to my life. So it is God's calling that as a believer, which is my identity, that by applying biblical truth to my life, I will go through a process that matures and develops my faith and my character. Does that make sense? Because being an eternally spiritual infant is not what God wants for any of us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 says it this way. And we are going to look at a lot of scripture today. So if you're taking notes, take notes. If you want to take screenshots, but I wanted to share these scriptures with you because this is where the truth is. If we are developed by applying God's truth to our lives, let's look at what the Bible says about that truth. Because truth has been under attack. People who... who are very loud about defining terms, are defining terms like truth outside of biblical context. So today's going to be a little bit of a dive into defining what that truth is. So let's look at it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know that instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus... Verse number three, it is God's will. If anybody here today is like, I'm not sure of what God's will and purpose is for my life, this is, this is it for you. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Another term that we will define. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Sanctified is that process of becoming holy. Sanctified is that same term of perfection. It's the process. It's the journey of being developed by applying God's truth to our lives. That's what sanctification is. So when we are sanctified, we are going through the process. We're being developed in our faith and in our character. So verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. So there's a difference talked about it today. There are two groups of people, maybe one who knows what they believe, maybe one who has professed their belief. There's a difference because your belief should indicate your behavior. So there there are those who do not know God. Verse 6, and in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So you're going to have to wrestle with it. Because this is from God. This is not not from me. It's not from the culture. It's not from the world. This This is from God himself. And it's good to wrestle with it. 
That's why I'm saying you, you can belong before you believe, but take it and wrestle with it. I wrestle with it. That is the process of sanctification, and I, I come to you very honestly with that. This is my struggle with this word perfection. I'm much more comfortable identifying over here than the, the truth that I can be sanctified, that God's call for me is holiness, that that is the will and, and the potential and the plan that God has for me. Wrestle with it. And when it rubs you wrong, it's a red flag that you need to lean in and wrestle a little bit. Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, But we ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because, here it is, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief and truth. And that's going to be what we unpack a little bit today, too. How are we sanctified? If sanctification is that process of holiness, how are we sanctified? According to the scripture, we are sanctified in a process through the spirit and belief in truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the calling to live a life of holiness, this journey describes sanctification. This describes the journey of of the call in Jesus in Matthew 5, 48, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It's this invitation into a process of sanctification. It's It's an invitation into a process to let God's word develop us. Not that we have to be sinless. Not that we have to be without blame. But that we are saying yes to a process of being developed. Sanctification, here's the definition for it, also from a concordance. And I think that it is so good. Sanctification is holiness. It is produced by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in the scripture in 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians, It says that you are saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The sanctifying work of the Spirit. Sanctification cannot happen within us without the Holy Spirit. So once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit, his power working within you that empowers you in this process of sanctification. It is a process produced by the Holy Spirit. It refers to the activity of the Holy Spirit in setting man apart unto salvation and transferring him into the ranks of the redeemed. And there are several scriptures, I think they were probably the ones listed in that previous slide, that paint this picture of being snatched out of one group of people and being placed in a different group of people. Called out of darkness into his glorious light is one that comes to mind. Called out of slavery and set to be free in Jesus Christ is another one that comes to mind. And those scriptures go right along with this definition that say that we have been set apart transferred into the, in, into the ranks of the redeemed and being enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. So sanctification is a process, and it's this weird word that it's a process, but it's also the result of a process. It's both. It's both the action and the journey of the process, and then it is the final work at the end of our life. So according to Second Thessalonians, sanctification, this journey of holiness, happens in us in two ways. Through the work of the Spirit, And belief in the truth. And I think the truth needs some definition as well. And so we're going to look at that today. So point number one, just to to recap that. God wants me to be developed. That is truth in God's scriptures. That he does want me to be developed. How? We're developed by applying biblical truth to our lives. And I mentioned we're not going to really get to talk about finding freedom. Because I had to choose two. This is, this is part of that because the reasons that we don't find freedom in our lives, the reasons that we cycle over and over and over in the same sin, the same bondage, the same struggles, the same generational curses, the reasons that we don't find freedom is because we have not yet applied the biblical truth to our lives. So when we don't apply God's biblical truth to our marriages, we continue to have the same fights over and over. And when we don't apply biblical truth to the way we spend money, we continue to have money problems. And when we don't apply biblical truth to the way we parent, we continue to struggle in our relationship with our children. And we continue to see our children struggle in their relationship with God. And when we don't apply biblical truth to conforming our lives to the holiness that he has destined for us, we stay tripped up in the same bondage and we haven't yet found freedom. 
So freedom comes from applying biblical truth in our lives. And, and if you have ever read the Bible and it rubs you wrong and you're like, well, I don't like that one, you're in good company. That is all of us. But we don't get to change traditional orthodoxy based on how it makes us feel. Truth is truth. And when it rubs us wrong, we have to wrestle with it. But we don't get to change it. Because then you end up with this Frankenstein kind of faith which is nothing but a monster that ends up killing you in the end. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert if you're in English class. You don't get to Frankenstein your faith. It's not good for you. It destroys you in the end when you become the definer of terms that God intends to define. So God wants me to be developed by applying biblical truth to my life. What is the biblical truth developing in me? My faith and my character. Those are good things to develop. And it only comes through trials. That's not very encouraging to you. But I heard it said this last week that every time something challenging or difficult happens to this person, this person says, well, God is doing this for me. This is for me. This challenging time, this suffering is for me. We love to identify with Christ in the resurrection. We love to identify with the power that resurrects Christ from the dead. We struggle in the suffering. We struggle to identify him, identify with him in the suffering. That is the place of development. And there's a question I think that comes up a lot when we talk about this. When we talk about God developing us. Well, doesn't God just love me the way that I am? Absolutely. Definitively, the answer is yes. God loves you and accepts you and chooses you right where you are. There's a story in John chapter 8 that I think depicts this really well. It's the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And the way that the scripture is written, it indicates that the, God, that the men who caught her were like following her patterns and her rhythms and her schedule throughout the day so they would know when to catch her. Because the Bible says that they caught her in the act of committing adultery and that they pulled her from her house. So you can put that picture together. It would, it would not have been a pretty picture. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. And he says, if any one of you is without sin, then you can throw the first stone. And one by one, the Bible says that the men turn around to leave because they know that they are not without sin. And then Jesus picks the woman up. And the Bible says that he, he forgave her of her sins and that he told her to go and sin no more. So yes, loves her, picks her up right where she is, but doesn't leave her there. Could you imagine reading the story in the Bible of a Jesus who was like, well, bless you. In your nakedness, in your exposure, in your pain, in your vulnerability, have a good day. That's not, that's not Jesus' will for any of us. Jesus' will for her was to meet her in that moment and then to, to develop her to say, walk with me. Let's walk this way. Sin no more. Walk together. Imagine in this moment, mention baby son. He gets two shout outs today. Imagine baby son running in here and, and he's in shorts and his knees are busted up and he's bleeding and he's crying because he tripped out here. Maybe there was some glass and sharp rocks and, and he's, he comes up here and he's just bleeding and he's crying in the middle of church. Imagine this. And imagine my son running to me and he's busted up. And I, and I run out to him and y'all would be like, yes, you should stop preaching to go take care of your son. Y'all would be like, that's a good parent. And I, and I pick him up and I hug him. I may not even be concerned what it was that he fell in out there because I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about him in this moment. And if I hugged him and if I set him in the chair and if I was like, wait there, I got to finish this. Y'all would be like, what's that number to CPS? That would not be a good or loving parent. In fact, it would be abusive to find somebody in their pain and then to leave them there. I don't love my son enough to, to leave him in his pain. I love him in that moment, but I want to help him heal. I want to help bandage him. I want to help wound him. And so Jesus meets us where we are. Yes, absolutely. But he loves us too much to leave us in our pain, in our brokenness, in our bondage. He wants to bring us along with him, and he says, walk this way. Sin no more. There's a better way, and it's found in the truth of my word. And if you will apply this to your life, you will be developed, you will be sanctified, you'll be on the journey for the calling and the purpose that I have for you, which is holiness. He loves us too much to leave us there. I think another question that comes up when we talk about this is, well, if we're striving for holiness, isn't that just behavior modification? And I would say to you, 
No. Point number two is that our belief determines our behavior, not our behavior determines our belief. You cannot behave your way into holiness. You cannot behave your way into sanctification. If you are trying to do that, while you're still working out the beliefs, you will face burnout. You have to behave out of a way that you believe. For example, this may be a little plug here for one child. They help children across the world. And they gave me that nice bag. But here's a lion. What I believe about this lion determines how I behave around it. My behavior is not, it's not the other way around. What I believe about this determines the way that I treat it. It's a lion, right? This is a lion. And if I believe that this is a, an actual lion, it's going to ter- determine the way that I behave around it. So imagine I had an actual lion over here. I couldn't do it. It was against the law. I couldn't have a real lion in here. But I have a picture of a lion for you. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. We'll put him here. Maybe. If he takes a nap, that's okay. They're pretty lazy. <laughs> What I believe about this lion determines the way I behave. What I believe about this lion determines the way I behave around it. I'm going to approach this lion with a different set of behaviors than I'm going to approach this lion because I believe different things about them. I'm not going to approach this one and and make my behaviors conform my beliefs. My behaviors come from my belief. What I believe about a thing determines my behavior. So at the beginning, I offered a question for, for thoughtful reflection. How much is your belief in Jesus impacting the way you believe? Because the way you think about the Lion of Judah, what you believe about the Lion of Judah determines the way that you behave. If someone were to ask why you don't cheat on your spouse for the married people in the house, if someone says, well, why don't you cheat on your spouse? It would not be a good day for you in your marriage for you to say because it's against the rules. That's not a good answer. Heads up. If it ever comes up, the answer is not, well, because it's against the rules. So we don't abstain from certain behaviors as a Christian because it's against the rules. No, I don't cheat on my spouse because I love him. I don't cheat on my spouse because of what I believe about him. That determines my behavior, not because it's against the rules. So I'm I'm faithful to Jesus. I behave a certain way because of what I believe about him. So our belief determines our behavior, not our behavior determining our belief. So when I place Jesus as the Lord of my life and I place the Bible as my standard of truth, everything changes. The Bible is my standard for truth. 2 Thessalonians says that you will be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and belief in the truth. The truth is only defined by Scripture. Truth is not defined by anything else. Our belief is to be in the truth, not in our personalities alone. Not to take that as truth. Not the Enneagram, not our horoscope, not culture, not any kind of theory, not any kind of philosophy, no other kind of opinion. No, no, nothing about shifting culture defines what is truth. Because those things change over time. What is truth is God's word and it stands true over time. And when the Bible is my standard for truth, everything about my life changes. The way I pray changes because of what I believe. What I believe about Jesus as the Son of God changes the way I pray. What I believe about Jesus as the Son of God changes the way I worship. It changes the way I lead. It changes every aspect about my life because of what I believe. Because I don't believe that Jesus is just a good man. I don't believe that he was just a good teacher. I don't believe that Jesus is an ethical code. I believe that he is the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again for my sins and that he sits at the right hand of the Father. And because that's what I believe, it determines the way I behave. I believe that Jesus is the catalyst for a total life transformation. And this is the foundation of the truth that we believe. And this is the foundation of the truth that takes us through the process of sanctification. It answers all of life's how how we spend our money, how we have relationships, how we walk out racial unity, how we approach gender equality, how we approach parenting, how we approach marriage. The Bible defines those terms. 
nobody, and nothing else. We cannot Mr. Potato Head our faith. We don't get to choose which parts go where. This part that fits well with me and this part that does not. You take the parts that do not fit well with you and you wrestle it out, but you stand on truth. So 2 Thessalonians says you will be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Number three is that when we are on a journey of sanctification, when you've said yes to Jesus and you're on the journey of sanctification, there will be fruit. And this, so to speak, would be the net of your swish, is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the net to living a life where you've discovered God's redemptive purpose for your life. And we're going to look at it in Galatians chapter 5. I want to read it first in the message version. And it's a long scripture, so lean in. Because I think that you'll hear that it, it feels like it could have been written today. And the fact that it's as true and descriptive today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago is proof that God's word never changes. That it's true for us over time because it speaks to the nature that is in humanity, not the shifting times of culture. So Galatians 5, starting in verse 13, says this, It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use the freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want and to destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't, you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other so that you cannot live at times one way and at times according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? It's this picture of trying to live life with one foot on both sides of the fence. I heard it said recently that you don't want to ride the fence because it hurts. And I would probably think that's true. And this scripture is calling you to choose the side that you want to live on. And if you're tired of the erratic compulsions of life that's dominated by the law, you give your life to the Spirit. To live life freely in the Spirit. It continues in verse 19. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Do you ever feel that struggle, always trying to get your own way all the time? Here's what it looks like. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Hey, sounds like our reality. A lot of times in the culture around us, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Hey, this wasn't written last year. This is, this is God's word. It's been around for thousands of years. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on and on. I was like, I feel you. I could go on and on. This isn't the first time I've warned you. You know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? What's the other side of that? What happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart. Guys, we need this in the world around us. Your neighborhoods, your kids' classrooms, your workplace. Our churches, this is the kind of life and and the culture that we need. We develop a willingness to stick with things 
a compassion of the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. You cannot just follow rules of religion. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good. Man, that sounds like freedom to me. It's crucified. It's that identifying with Christ even in his suffering. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold on to it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better than or other than the worst. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. So that's the message version of Galatians chapter 5. And I feel so strongly that that really can characterize our society today the division, the, all the things that it describes. But there is an alternative to that way of life, and it is a life found in the Spirit. It is a life where our, our hearts and our lives are given to Jesus. But it speaks to the implications of what that means for us, which is holiness. It is that call to being sanctified. Here's, here's the fruits of the Spirit in the NIV version. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against things, such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, this is our identity. You can be confident that you have discovered your purpose when you are walking securely and confidently in your identity. Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh, flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So as I read the fruits of the Spirit, we hear things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do these things describe your life? Do some of them sting a little more than the others? These, these are the fruits that would be evident in our lives. And so in closing, I wanted to give you three practical action steps to obtaining this net for your swish in life to discovering your purpose as a believer, which is to be developed and sanctified in that process. So the first thing is to be committed. Be committed, be committed, be committed. Don't quit. The way that we are developed is in hard times and hard times and, and trials and tribulations have a way of making people leave their orthodoxy. Struggles have a way of making people retreat from those things, but don't. Don't quit. Stay in it and be committed. Be committed through growing pains. Be committed through mess ups, through failures, through falling down, through getting it wrong. Stay committed. Stay committed. Stay anchored to truth, God's word, no matter what. When you're wrestling with it. When you're still figuring it out for yourself, stay committed. Ephesians chapter 4 says, So Christ gave himself, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, that's where we get the idea of a fivefold ministry, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. So it's this idea that he's given us these gifts so that we may be developed, so that we may be built up. And listen to this, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure, that completeness. That's what that word perfect in the first verse in Matthew 5, 48 talks about, that we are complete, that we would become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. You don't have to go into um, despair every time there's a new ideology that comes out because you're anchored in truth. This is what defines it for you. It says, instead, speaking truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, which is Christ. So the first thing is to be committed. 
And the second thing is to be in relationship with other believers. Let people push back a little bit. Be in relationship. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, but be in relationship with people who can help sharpen you. I have made a vow to myself, and I share it with you today, so maybe you can make the same vow to yourself. This is the vow that Kelly has made with Kelly. I have vowed to myself that I will never suffer in isolation. That if I am feeling pain or if I am feeling um, distraught or if I am struggling, that I never do it alone. I always reach out. It's not always to the same person. I have different people in my life that I can go to for different things, but I never suffer alone. I always reach out. And the moment I'm like, no, it's okay. You don't really need to reach out. You'll be fine. That's a red flag to me that I definitely have to text somebody. And so I've made a vow to myself with a red flag alert that when I am, I am struggling with something that I always reach out. And then if I hear the thought that I don't need to, then I definitely do. That's my check. That's my checks and balances. And so I definitely do. So be in relationship. Be committed. Be in a relationship. And number three is to be connected to the vine. If we desire the fruits of the Spirit in our lives... You cannot just break off a branch and bring in a branch and watch the branch produce fruit. John 15 has this picture in great detail that the branch has to stay connected to the vine and that Jesus Christ is the vine and that only when we are connected to him that we can obtain fruit in our lives. I cannot be loving. I cannot be patient. I cannot be faithful. I cannot be kind. I cannot have long suffering. I cannot have any of those things on my own enough in every circumstance aside from being rooted and connected to and abiding in Jesus Christ, the vine. So be connected. He is the vine. We have to be connected to him, our source. And sometimes we stay in bondage. We haven't found that freedom yet because we're disconnected from the vine. We're disconnected from, from our source of what actually produces fruit in our lives. And when we justify our ways out of what is God's calling for us, which is that for holiness, when we justify our ways out of it, we become compromised. And when we become compromised as a church, it weakens our power. And then we're just basically community without power. And that's not what the church is called to do. The church is called to be that full of power. And our power comes when we're walking in the fullness that God has for us, which is holiness. And as a church, as a family, as a body, we're not isolated from one another. The way we each live independently affects the, the effectiveness and the power that we have collectively together as a church. That all of us together, our lifestyle, it matters. It matters to the power that we walk in as a church. In a marriage with me and Landon, the way we both live matters. His level of holiness and faithfulness impacts me. It impacts our children. My level of faithfulness and commitment and, and holiness impacts him. It impacts our children. Together as a family, if we want to be a church of power that's making a difference and walking in the effectiveness and the fullness of the purpose that God has for us as a church, we've got to chase after holiness. We've got to embrace God's truth for our lives that he does desire holiness for us. I hope you hear my heart in this today. It's not necessarily an easy thing to preach because it's not an easy thing to live. I don't ever want you to feel like I'm coming down on you. Or This is just my personality, by the way. I try to not do it. But I'm not coming down on you at all. This is us. This is our journey. Our journey as Christians. This is our journey as believers. This is our journey as a church. And it is to walk in the fullness and the purpose that God has for us, which is holiness. We are called to be different. We're not called to live life like everybody else because we have the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit inside of us. How can we live like we did before we found him? Why would we want to? In fact, Paul answers that. It's like, well, if I have grace and I have forgiveness, then I could, I could keep on sinning. And, and the Bible says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, it's the opposite. Because you know Jesus, because you know him, it changes the way that you live. And I love the way Galatians 5.25 ends when it's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. It says, it says since we live by the Spirit, Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So I want to close this two-part series, Walk This Way, with this charge to you is to keep in step with the Spirit, step by step by step, every day, morning, noon, night, day after day after day, that you are walking with him, 
that you are walking with him step by step. If you would go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes, I'm gonna lead us in a time of prayer. And as I was thinking about this prayer time, I wanted to pray for those who want to walk with him step by step. And the fact that that starts with a genuine relationship with Jesus. So if you wanted to start a genuine relationship with Jesus today, if you've never said yes to him, and that is you, I would like to pray for you today. And also I wanted to pray for those who maybe want to make a recommitment to truth. And and maybe there's even this moment that leads you to a place of repentance that says, I have Mr. Potato Head in my faith. I've taken the parts I believe and I ignore the parts I don't. And I'm going to repent for that. And I'm making a commitment to be anchored to the truth. I want to be tethered to truth, not my idea of it, not the parts that make me feel good, but all complete and only the truth. So if you're in the first part of that and you would like to give your heart to Jesus today, I would like to pray for you. You can just put your hand over your heart if that's you, and I would lead you in this prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died on the cross for our sins. We thank you that, that, that you gave your life for us, that I don't have to be the pure and spotless, perfect one, but you are, and that you gave yourself for me, and I receive you today, and I say yes to you today as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, I lift up those this morning who are saying, you know, I've, I've been Mr. Potato heading my faith, and I, I want to repent of that. I want to repent for the times that I've rejected truth because it didn't make me feel good. God, we, we confess that to you today. God, we repent for the times that, that we fully embrace the parts that are easy and then we reject the parts that aren't. God, I pray today that we will make a resolve in our hearts to stand on truth every single day, that we will walk step by step with you, that we will walk the way that you walked, and that we'll go to your word for how we should walk in all aspects of our lives, that there is no part of our life that goes untouched by you and your truth. And God, where there is a war being waged against truth in the world around us, God, I pray for an army of Christians that will stand resolutely on your word no matter what. That we don't have to waver from truth to be accepted. We don't have to waver from truth to have friends. We don't have to waver from truth to be relevant because you are relevant yesterday, today, and every day. Lord, we thank you for your truth that reigns true for every single one of us in all parts of the world throughout generations. God, only you can do that. God, only you can do that. And Lord, we confess our faith and our, and our trust in you this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.